and Rita, I'll go ahead and hit broadcast in, uh, in just a few seconds and we'll be live. So I'm going to hit it now. Hi, everybody. I'm Rita Khan. I am the marketing manager at Ribbon and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. We'll get started shortly here, but we'll give everyone just a couple minutes to jump on. For those of you that are just jumping on, we are just giving an extra minute for latecomers to get all set up with today's webinar and we'll get started in just a minute. All right, let's get started. Hi, everybody. I am Rita Khan. I am the marketing manager at Ribbon, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. I'm going to share a few housekeeping notes before we dive in. We expect today's session to last about half an hour with time reserved at the end for questions. Just submit your questions in the Q&A portion of the Zoom window, and we'll try our best to answer them all. And if we don't, we'll follow up with an email with an answer. You will also receive a $10 ribbon reward for attending today's webinar, as you probably know. Please be sure to attend the whole session so Zoom captures your attendance correctly and so you can learn how to access your free 90-day trial of Sawtooth Software's Discover after this webinar. With that said, I will now introduce the speakers. Up first, we will have Brian Orm, the president of Sawtooth Software. He has spent the last 25 years teaching, writing, and consulting on predicting consumer preferences with conjoint analysis. He's authored and co-authored three books on the subject and over 100 white papers and articles. He also enjoys travel, hiking, and scuba diving. Brian is going to give us a brief overview of conjoint and MaxDiff research and how powerful it can be. Next, to speak about the impact of incentives paired with your research will be Jignesh Shah. Jignesh is the CEO of Ribbon, an incentives management platform for market researchers. Ribbon is used by more than a thousand companies like Pandora, UPS, and Dropbox to take the pain and cost out of delivering incentives. Jignesh has also served on the board of the Insights Association Massachusetts chapter. Finally, we will get a brief walkthrough of Discover from Justin Luster. Justin has been with Sawtooth Software for 20 years and is the product manager of Lighthouse Studio and Discover. He is passionate about simple solutions that please customers, and he also loves mountain biking and skiing. Now that everyone's been introduced, I'll pass it off to Brian to kick things off. Brian, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rita. I'm going to give a brief introduction to Sawtooth Software and also a little bit about conjoint analysis and Max Fifth. Sawtooth Software is the leading platform for product optimization and pricing. I'm just not saying that. We've been around the longest. We were the first movers. We got into this space starting in the 1980s. Sati Software is the most respected provider and, con and group in the industry for software and conferences and trainings on conjoint analysis and related marketing science topics. We're the most widely used software platform for both Max Diff, also known as Best Worth Scaling, and conjoint analysis. It is a do-it-yourself platform that's easy to do, backed up by our solid and friendly technical support staff. We have a lot of customers. This just represents a very few of them that we've gained their permission to be able to show their logos on Satsu Software's website. Satsu Software is often used as a survey-based technique for optimizing products. Because you want to know what do customers want, what's important to them, and how much would they be willing to pay. Now within an organization, it's very myopic 
if we just let the engineers and managers and executives decide what to build or offer and how to price it. We can do much better than that. But some kinds of research that's been that have been used in the past have, are just not very effective. It's weak to approach things always with the five and the 10 point rating scales. Because you know what happens with five and 10 points rating scales. People say that everything's important. They straight line us. And also, depending upon the cultural background or the country that the person comes from, there can be a lot of scale use bias. For example, people in Germany tend to use lower points on a rating scale than, for example, people in India or South America. And so when you want to try to compare people across countries or just across different personalities, some people tend to be a little bit more pessimistic or optimistic, and that can mess up our five and 10 point rating scales data. I wanna to talk to you about some better solutions. One of them is a very easy advanced technique to use, which is called maximum difference scaling, also best worst scaling. Let's say that we had 10 or 20 items about choosing a fast food restaurant. And we wanted to measure how important these are. We could just take these 10 or 20 items and put them in a ratings grid or show them one at a time and ask for a five point or a 10 point rating scale. But you know what we're gonna get. We're gonna get so much straight lining, so much scale use bias, the data won't be as powerful. We can get better data with the same sample size if we ask a more effective question that forces people to trade things off rather than allowing them to be lazy and say that everything's important. For example, if we were studying 10 or 20 items, we might choose to show four of them randomized across people at a time and ask for each match diff question, which item is most important and, each, and which one is least important. This particular respondent is gonna do seven screens to be able to cover all 10 or 20 items where each screen will show a different subset of items. And across people, we're gonna be able to look at which items tended to be rated most important most and least important most. And we can use Bayesian estimation of the scores to estimate strong and stable scores at the individual level, giving us much better data with greater discrimination and free from scale use bias. There's no scale to use. So the way that Germans answer the questionnaire is the same as Indians. They choose a most important and a least important, and the scale does not get in the way of being able to estimate solid and bias-free scores. Okay, there's an extension of maximum difference scaling, a multiple attribute extension that you've often heard of called conjoint analysis or choice-based conjoint. In conjoint analysis, we're showing more than one attribute at a time because products are often made up of more than one attribute. Here we're showing a choice task having to do with choosing an automobile. We have different brands, colors, the type of engines, and prices. And across questions, notice this respondent is gonna get eight questions. We are going to randomize the presentation of brands and colors. In this case, Ford Mustang is shown at blue, but in another case, Ford Mustang will be shown at red. And by randomizing the order and the presentation of these items, we can tease out what appears to be affecting people's choice. Are people choosing products because of the brand, because of the color, because of the price? With an effective randomized experiment, we can tease out those effects very powerfully. That is conjoint analysis. And it allows us to make predictions about all the possible combinations of the brands, colors, speeds, and prices. So that essentially means that conjoint analysis is so much more powerful than standard A-B testing because we're testing hundreds or thousands or millions of possible combinations of products. It's not just A to B testing, it's A to gazillion testing. We ask potential buyers what they would choose, which feels a lot like what they do when they buy products in the real world. That's why conjoint analysis is much more powerful and more realistic than other survey questioning devices. We set up an experiment and we set up a buying situation that feels like the real world and we observe what people choose as we vary the product characteristics.
Conjunct analysis is often used to optimize pricing for the firm. It's weak research just to ask people what they'd pay. People tend to game the system. They'll tend to over-exaggerate or under-exaggerate what they pay. Having them choose among different products in more realistic scenarios like they do in the real world gets much better at pricing research questions and more realistically measures price sensitivity. Perhaps the reason that conjunct analysis has grabbed hold of the industry starting 30 years ago was the fact that you can deliver what-if market simulators to managers, to decision makers, and it feels a lot like an Excel simulator. In fact, you can deliver it in an Excel simulator, and there's also specialized software that Sachi Software provides for what-if simulators. In what-if simulators, you type in products in competition with one another, and then you can vary their characteristics. You can change their colors, you can change their prices, and see how the market would react as you change your product mix. You can also, if you have an online, if you have an optimization algorithm, ask a simulator to search for the products that will maximize share, revenue, or profits for you. <clears throat> I'm going to talk to you about some examples that were presented at the Saatchi Software Conference last year. Last year, Jennifer Avery from Universal Parks and Resorts came out to our conference to talk about how they're using MaxDiff to test different prices and of tickets to special events <clears throat> at the park. They're also using conjunct analysis as well. They use MaxDiff particularly for idea screening to identify great new ideas that they're trying to identify internally. Lifetime products also came out and showed how they're using conjunct analysis to help them design many of the products like you're seeing on the screen here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Procter & Gamble also came out to talk about specifically how they're using MaxDiff for product packaging design. They're showing graphics on the screen that vary the colors and the claims on the product packages plus pricing to be able to determine optimal products, packages, and prices to deliver. They also use this data to be able to create needs-based segments to figure out whether some segments of the market can be reached with a different product than others. Google also has been uh, a main player at our conference. Chris Chapman often comes out and is actually on the conference committee. He talked about how Google is currently teaching an internal class to over 130 of their internal researchers, product managers, and designers, and engineers who now are using maximum difference scaling to prioritize user needs. Zappos, Sorov from Zappos, came out at the, to the Santi Software Conference to talk about how they're using CBC to optimize their online store for shoes. <clears throat> Sachi Software, like I said, is a complete solution. It's more than just software. A subscription to our platform provides you attentive, expert technical support that goes far beyond what you'd normally find in technical support for software in our industry. We offer free hosting of surveys, so we don't ding you that way, and endless resources for learnings. There are videos, there's white papers, an online forum, workshops, webinars like these, and also in-person conferences for learning how to apply these marketing science techniques to improve your research process. One of the things that we haven't been able to do very well until now, now that we're partnering with Ribbon, is to be able to provide a seamless and a painless way for you to be able to pay your, res your respondents, give your respondents their incentives after they've completed the survey. You all know that uh, declining response rate is a serious problem in our industry. And if you incentivize respondents properly, you'll be able to boost your response rates and be able to get more representative sample. And so at this point, I'm going to hand it off to Jignesh from Ribbon to talk about their solution. And then Justin's going to show you how easy it is to integrate Sati Software's platform with delivering these incentives through Ribbon. Jignesh? 
Okay, thank you, Brian. Uh, and, and those are some very impressive names uh, who came out uh, to the Sawtooth Conference uh, last year, and we look forward maybe as a partner participating in the next one. Um, good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Jignesh with Ribbon. A little bit about Ribbon before we dive into um, the importance of incentives, how to properly incentivize um, survey takers, and, and then kind of leading on to a demo of Sawtooth software. A uh, little bit about us, uh, we are Ribbon. Uh, we specialize in incentives for surveys and research, uh, serving more than a thousand customers globally. Uh, we deliver anywhere from 30 to 50,000 rewards on a monthly basis. We've delivered now well over 1.2 million rewards around the world. Um, and we actually love partnering with leading edge, industry leading platforms like Sawtooth Software. Um, that bring a lot of value to their customers. And with the addition of rewards to the platform, we feel we can um, dramatically boost both the quantity and quality of the data collection that you can perform using these platforms. Uh, if you go to the next slide, um, I want to highlight that at Ribbon, we can actually support two different styles of rewards programs. Uh, one you may be very familiar with already, we call them instant reward. The idea here is that, you know, you offer a reward instantly upon completion of, let's say a survey. So complete the survey, get a $10 reward card. That's what we call instant rewards. And that is a very popular way of using Ribbon. Um, we also provide a points-based reward system. So think of it as sort of a loyalty system or a frequent uh, respondent system for research. And a points-based reward system is valuable for panels, for insights communities. Uh, it's also great for longitudinal studies or multi-part studies where retention of the same participant is very important. So you, in case of a points-based reward system, we, we allow you to offer people points which can be accumulated and then, then redeemed for rewards down the road. So we support both styles of uh, incentives, but let me touch upon why incentives are, are important in the first place. And as Brian alluded to in our industry, uh, it is becoming increasingly challenging to get uh, people to respond and to get the right people to respond. And there are lots of reasons for this. Here are five most common reasons we see why response rates are not what they need to be. In many cases, the respondent just does not have a relationship with you. Maybe it's a, it's a random sample uh, that was selected to answer a survey and they lack any inherent motivation to give you feedback. Um, in many cases we see, especially in case of product-based surveys or service-based surveys, you're trying to get experience data, uh, satisfaction data. Often the people who've had a bad experience are motivated to speak up while people who've had a good experience feel no need to give you feedback. And we call this the squeaky wheel syndrome, and that can skew your data in a certain way. For more complex surveys, uh, and this can happen with uh, MaxDiff or Conjoint, that re do require the respondent to you know, engage themselves, understand the question, provide thoughtful answers. Sometimes you know, they may start with these surveys and just not feel motivated enough as they get into the survey to complete the survey. And you see high number of incompletes in those situations. Uh, we are all familiar with survey fatigue. Uh, we all get feedback requests from brands we, we buy from, uh, we use uh, as consumers, and we all understand that we only have so much time, so why should anyone respond to your survey over somebody else's survey? So these are some common reasons why we are seeing falling response rates to surveys, but the right use of incentives can really turn the dial in the other direction and help you get not only good responses, but also more representative responses. Here's in fact some statistics around why incentives can be so powerful. This is an MRA Olson study that very clearly showed that in case of US physicians, 94% would not even respond to surveys absent an incentive. And that the incentive plays a very big role in motivating them to complete a survey. So incentives do work, they're powerful, uh, and the results you can get uh, with the right use of incentives are, are as follows. Here are some examples on the next slide. 400% you know, increase in response rates. 
So anywhere from 100 to 400% is actually pretty par for the course for our customers to see that jump in response rates with the right incentives. But in addition to increase in response rate, you can also see significant improvement in administrative time saved and just automation, just the overall confidence in the rewards process. So um, uh, lots of great benefits. Uh, we can quantify this in terms of the admin time say we see an average of 75% reduction in admin burden when it comes to incentives automation. So this is when you integrate incentives into something like software. software. Uh, there's very little work you have to do. The software platforms do most of the work for you. And it's also great for your respondents who certainly don't like waiting days or weeks to receive the reward you promised them. On the next slide, you will see a screenshot from the ribbon platform uh, and it's designed to help you run rewards, not just for one survey or two survey, but a series of surveys. It is very common to have ribbon customers running multiple surveys and projects in parallel and will help you organize all of those into campaigns and keep track of your costs, your expenses, your rewards and your recipients. And lastly, let me end with a slight, a small taste for how the reward experience works. We deliver rewards instantly upon your approval or upon completion by email. Um, recipients can choose from rewards that you curate for them. So if you, are a, if you have a client or you are a brand that only wants to show certain rewards, you can curate the options available. Uh, in case of each survey, the reward is delivered from your email address with your branding, your messaging, and it's a very easy, smooth, and fast experience for the respondent. So with that, let me now hand over the baton to Justin to walk us through a quick demo of the Sawtooth platform and where you can plug in rewards into that platform. So over to you, Justin. Thanks, Janesh. Uh, so yeah, I'm Justin Lester from Sawtooth Software and love to just uh, speak for a few minutes on what we've been working pretty hard on, which is called Discover. Uh, Discover is our kind of streamlined web-based survey platform for making surveys. And we're really good at making it easy to do conjugate analysis surveys and max diff surveys. And we also have some powerful just general survey capability. Uh, we, uh, as a thank you for uh, watching this webinar today, we're gonna offer you 90, 90 days uh, full feature uh, experience with Discover. So this, uh, just a few uh, screenshots here. Uh, we allow you to ask select questions, grid questions, numerics, et cetera. Uh, we also have uh, powerful skip logic and the ability to do quota control and piping. On the next slide, uh, but what, what we're really good at is max diff. And so, we made it very simple to create a max diff exercise here. You select max diff and you get the type of uh, question that you see on the right. You get a series of these max diff questions that as Brian explained, shows only a few of the items at a time and ask them to select their, their favorite and their least favorite. And we do a series of these questions to collect this data. It's, uh, you might be intimidated by this, but it's actually, really straightforward. We've worked pretty hard to make it easy. And all you really need to do is paste in a list of items. In this example, we've pasted in a list of ice cream flavors. And from there, we will actually uh, build the survey and you collect the data, send it out to your respondents. And on this screen, we're showing uh, the results of the MaxDiff survey. So you can see here that cookie dough uh, was ranked first of the respondents and so on. So we not only have a rank, a rank order of the ice cream flavors in this example, but we also know how much better cookie dough is than the number two, mango. And you can also see that mango and vanilla are close to tied. So this gives you additional information that you wouldn't get uh, in a regular uh, ranking type survey. We also have the ability to do uh, simulators and turf analysis in, in MaxDiff. The next type of uh, exercises that we do really well is of course conjoint analysis. And Discover makes it easy. You select a, a choice-based conjoint there from the list and it will make the type of survey you kind of see on the right there where you see 
uh, several products or services offered, and then the respondents to uh, this respondent then needs to select which one they would choose or their favorite. And of course, choice-based conjoint is really good at seeing where people make trade-offs. Are they, are they selecting things based on price or brand, et cetera? So at Discover, all you need to do is enter in these different features. So in this example, you can just see one feature here, the brand, and we have different brands for cell phones. And then also, you know, we would enter price. So you enter these uh, features and settings, and then we will build the survey for you. And then you send it out to your respondents. And on the next slide, you'll see the types of results we get from a conjugate analysis survey. You're able, after we collect the data, we're able to configure different products or services there at the bottom. And then we can do what Brian referred to as these what if scenarios. If we put these three products into the market, which one would command, according to the data, which one would, would gain the most market share? And you're able to kind of tweak and, and mess around with different uh, features of these products and see the results. Okay, uh, here at the end, I just want to say when, when, the finish, when the survey finishes, as Janesh uh, explained, you can easily link your respondents onto the ribbon site where you can offer uh, an incentive of of a gift card or something. So you would click a, uh, add a terminate question here at the bottom. Next slide. And then uh, you would then enter into, uh, into ribbon system and get the link that you need uh, to link respondents. So you can paste their link into our software here. And what will happen is respondents will seamlessly be redirected to the ribbon page where they will be able to claim uh, their, their award. And uh, you are able to pass through uh, respondent IDs and that kind of thing as well. So yeah, we're really excited about Discover. I've been working hard on it. We continue to work hard. You can check it out at discover.satusoftware.com. And we're also uh, happy to spend some time with you on the phone, kind of uh, going over the different features. And again, as a, as a thanks, uh, we'll give you a, a 90 day uh, full featured um, experience with Discover. That's it. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Justin. Brian, if we can move to the next slide, I'd like to remind everyone of some awesome next steps that they can take right after this webinar. As Justin just mentioned, you will get an email um, giving you the instructions on how to access your 90-day free subscription to Sawtooth Software's Discover, as well as three free one-hour webinar training sessions. And then of course, keep an eye out for your ribbon reward. And as a bonus, you can also sign up for a free 30 minute reward strategy consultation with one of our awesome reward specialists. Now that you know about these benefits, let's read some questions. So my first question is for Brian. Brian, Shira would like to know, I'm not clear with the difference between MaxDiff and Conjoint and the use cases for each. Could you please clarify? Super. <clears throat> MaxDiff can really be thought of as a one attribute version of a conjoint analysis with lots of levels. So for example, let's imagine you had uh, 15 attributes uh, describing what makes you want to go to a fast food restaurant or not. It's got, you know, clean floors, it's got friendly service. That's a typical example. So when a client or when you, if you're the client, uh, has a list of items and wants to uh, score them, and uh, then you'd be thinking about maximum difference scaling. Maybe those items are, are graphics. Maybe you've mocked up some, uh, some products and the way that they look, and you've got uh, 50 mockups of the product packaging with a claim on it. Uh, you might, if those are just the 50 that you're testing, you might think of those as 50 levels of a max diff. However, if you've got a problem that's a multiple attribute problem where you want to figure out how uh, different brands and different colors and different speeds and different prices affect the choice and you think that there might be some special synergies or interactions that happen when certain brands get together with certain colors, for example, then you're going to want to think about a conjugate analysis. There's multiple attributes that are factoring in and you're 
varying the attributes independently of one another and you think that there might be some synergies or special stuff that happens when levels of brand, for example, get together with levels of color. And then you'd want to use conjugate analysis. But to be honest, there's some circumstances where you might teeter back and forth between using max diff and conjugate analysis and it might get into a gray area. Of course, if you have any questions after you've read white papers and documentations or even beforehand, if you just want to call up our technical support team, uh, these people really know their stuff and they're happy to talk to you even about just conceptual stuff about whether to use max diff or conjugate analysis. Awesome. Thank you, Brian. Jagnesh, I've got two questions here that I think you'll be able to answer um, just in one concise answer. So first, someone would like you to discuss the considerations you should make um, when uh, deciding if you should provide the incentive immediately at the end of the survey versus first reviewing the data. And someone else would like to know how you stop people from getting the reward that do not benefit the study. Oh, I think you're on mute there, Jagnesh. Okay, um, so let me take the first one. I see it's coming from John Voda. Uh, hello, John. Uh, good to hear from you again. Hey, um, John. He's a friend of mine too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, this is a great question. So uh, both are options in Ribbon. You can either automatically and immediately upon survey completion, send out the reward, or you can ask Ribbon to hold the respondents until you review and approve them uh, before the rewards are sent out. So we have a built-in approval workflow in the system and you can definitely choose not to reward immediately uh, and only reward upon approval. Uh, and both situations kind of have, have their place. We generally recommend doing the automatic approval and instant reward where you are sure about both the uh, the, the quality of the respondent and the quality of the response. So if it is an invitation only survey, for example, where you have a pre-built list and maybe you have sent out validated individualized links or maybe links with pin numbers that ensures only those respondents can respond to that survey, then you have a great deal of confidence in who is responding to your survey. And with, with that level of confidence, you may choose to say automatically send the reward. But if you have a situation where maybe it's an open link or even if it is an invitation only survey, you do want to do some additional manual screening of the response before the reward goes out, then we would recommend turning on approvals in Ribbon uh, and, and then deciding based on the quality of the response or any other criteria that makes sense for your program to then manually issue the reward. So both are options. And the big difference would be what is your level of confidence and the quality of the respondent and their response. Awesome. Yeah. Go ahead, Jagnesh, you have anything else? Uh, I think there was another question was, I sort of maybe along these lines, you know, how do we ensure that if we're offering incentives, we're still, we are still inviting the right people to take the survey. And what I would say to that is that, you know, that should always be a good practice to make sure that you're correctly identifying and segmenting and inviting the right people. Um, in addition, you know, we often see researchers using question-based screening techniques to screen out certain people who are not qualified to take the survey regardless or are maybe potentially not qualified to respond to the survey. So all of that good practice in terms of recruiting and screening out, all of that should continue. If you do continue doing that, the incentives will ensure that only the right people are being motivated to complete your survey and receive a reward. Awesome. Thank you, Jagnesh. All right, Brian, multiple people have questions about sample size. So I'll start here. What are the sample size implications of a conjoint rather than old fashioned scale type survey? And someone else wants to know, how do you determine the minimum sample size for a conjoint study? Sample size questions are good questions for sure. And uh, it's a sliding scale. I mean, more sample is always better. It just comes down to what you're willing to pay for. But as long as your sampling is good, and uh, you'd always want to have uh, more sample rather than fewer. With conjugate analysis, you really need to think about how many levels are in each attribute and how many attributes there are in total. The nice thing is that Sati Software's tools uh, provide a nice, uh, what we call design test, which 
we give you a rule of thumb to look for in terms of the precision. The design test lets you pre-plan ahead of time and say, what's gonna happen if I feel this with 200 respondents? You press a button, it randomly answers the questionnaire with 200 respondents, and then it calculates the precision. And the precision is not based really on the respondent answers, but on the quality of the combinations we show people. So we could just use random robots uh, we give some nice little recommendations based on uh, based on our experience. So you can use that uh, that test design tool within Satu software as a as a as a way to plan out your sample. It's it's very typical in conjoint analysis to have anywhere between 200 to 500 respondents. And if you're studying three or four market segments and you want to be able to have really good precision on each of three or four market segments, it's typical for the sample size to go up to 800 or 1,000. With max diff, sample sizes of, of 300 to 500 are, are normal. But with really expensive sample, uh, you can still get away and do a lot better than expert opinion or a guess or rating scales with even maybe 40, 50, or 60 respondents if these respondents are really hard to get, like very expensive doctors, obviously you'd want to have more, you'd want to have 300 respondents, but if they're super expensive, you still can do conjoint analysis with only about 50 respondents, as long as you keep your attribute and level list uh, small. Thank you, Brian. All right, we'll just answer a couple more questions here to be mindful of time. This one's for Jagnesh. Jignesh, do you have any guidelines or best practices regarding incentive value for a variety of different B2B respondents? Someone said, for example, small to medium merchants, corporate professionals, professional service, et cetera. Yeah, so we have a rule of thumb that we recommend when we are working with uh, customers um, to arrive at, uh, at the ballpark uh, compelling reward value, as we call it. And, and here is a rule of thumb. Take uh, the amount of time it will take for someone to complete your survey, multiply it by sort of the average um, compensation that your target demographic makes, and then bump it up by 25 to 50%, right? Uh, so three variables here. How long is your survey? Um, what is the value of the respondent's time? And then a little premium on top to make it compelling. Um, what is important to remember here, and we often see this, is be realistic about how long it will take for someone to complete your survey. Sometimes we see researchers are a little too optimistic about how quickly someone can complete the survey, and so they underestimate that time, and then you get higher incompletes. So be, just be honest or candid or just maybe test how long it takes to complete your survey. Uh, the rest of the data will vary by your demographic, like what is the average someone makes will be very different for say a nurse practitioner than a VP of marketing, right? Um, but that should give you the rule of thumb. Um, in terms of B2B uh, respondents, you know, one tip I would add, which works amazingly well, is to, is to add charitable donations as options to your rewards. Uh, we see this working really well for B2B respondents who sometimes may be shy about accepting an incentive. Um, and you know, they may be more motivated by the ability to donate the, the reward to a charity of their choice. So that's a little tip for, for B2B respondents. Got it, thanks, Jagdish. All right, one last question and then we'll wrap up, just be mindful of time for everyone here. Uh, this one is going to be for Brian. Uh, Brian, are there any special considerations for Conjoint or Maxif when applied to SaaS software? when applied to SaaS software. So software is a service, okay? Mm -hmm. It's a service, but it also feels like a product. Uh, if it can be broken down into different pieces, if you think that uh, the total value of the product is based on multiple characteristics, then that's good. But uh, I can't really think of a special reason that SaaS might be different from any other product uh, or service, uh, but, a lot of it depends on whether the SaaS software is being offered as a bundle of uh, features underneath it or whether um, it's really kind of a la carte where there's like different modules and I could um, configure my own modules so or my own SaaS delivery by saying I want to get these modules. 
So I would say that if you offer your product, a SaaS product with its characteristics, it's kind of a take it or leave it offer and people, or maybe there's a, 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 a bronze, silver and gold version of it, uh, then you, that's just standard content analysis. If you uh, sell the product more as an a la carte, click the click what you want in this a la carte. Hey, I want this module, this module, and this module. Then that's more of a menu-based choice type problem. So you have to think about how you sell the product and how people choose it. Uh, is it like three packages, bronze, silver, gold, and people pick the characteristics and they just kind of take it or leave it? Or do they actually go in and configure module by module what they want to buy? And in that case, it would be menu-based choice. Those are my thoughts. Got it. Thank you, Brian. Very helpful. All right. Thank you so much for everyone that joined us today and for our speakers. I know we had plenty of questions, and I'm sorry that we couldn't get to them all. But we'll try our best to follow up after the webinar and answer them um, offline. Just want to say a quick thank you to everyone again for joining and keep an eye out on your email for the follow-up offers. Thanks everyone. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.